from the Charleston County School District to NAACP to state and local politics, Alpha Ravenel has never missed any words. And when I talked with him exclusively for this edition of Quentin Reports, it was no different. Mr. Ravenel, you have been out of the limelight now for some time. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm just getting on fine. I like it, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to believe it, but uh, in, in, in my political career, I have spent uh, 32 years in some kind of elective office. Yeah. And I've forgotten how many uh, races I've run, and uh, who must be 23 to 27, something like that. And uh, I've served on the House of Representatives, the lower house, way back, way back when I was in my 20s, and Jimmy Burns was the governor. And uh, then, of course, I served two different times in the state senate. I was there in, in the senate, elected in 80. And then uh, I ran for Congress in uh, 86 and was, was elected. And uh, I served four terms there. And then, uh, then I, uh, I ran for governor. And um, I made the, the runoff, but my old friend David Beasley beat me in the runoff. And, so then I was kind of in limbo, and uh, Harry Holman, who used to be our mayor, who's going to his reward now. Uh, we, you know, we had terrible problems with the old bridges, the old Cooper River bridges, and um, he persuaded me to go back to the Senate. Uh, single purpose, to put together an organization to find the money for the bridge. That was always a problem with the bridge. It's so expensive, you know. So I did that. And I uh, served two more terms in the state senate. Get that, did that, was able to get that done with a lot of help from a lot of people. And then uh, I was persuaded to run for the school board. So I ran for the school board and was elected, and I served four years there. Wow. And uh, so then I, I um, getting up in my 80s. Yes. And uh, get, getting a little old for for that, so I retired. Well, I know you had a few health scares in the past. How are you feeling? I feel fine, I feel great. Yes. I never ever really had any major health problems, and uh, th then, oh, I don't know, about six or seven, maybe eight years ago, I came down with a, uh, a very strange, rare disease known as Guillain-Barre syndrome. And uh, I had never heard of it. Most people had never heard of it. But uh, it's a pretty tough disease. It can kill you. It can kill you. It affects the diaphragm, and, you know, it, where you breathe. And if if, uh, if it does, and you don't get some help pretty quick, it can kill you. When you stop breathing, you die. <laughs> now that you're retired, how's it going? Fine. You're doing yeah. fine. You know, yeah. I um, yes. get around. I've got. You know, we got 17 grandchildren and uh, nine children, and uh, got a great grand now. And um, and uh, and I have this place in the country, my wife and I, and yeah. we spend a lot of time out there. And all through the years, I um, acquired timberland, bought timberland. You know, so I own a good bit of timberland scattered around the yeah. low country. Yes. And I visit that and what have you, and um, <clears throat> I'm always looking for more timberland if I can find things that track a timber at reasonably priced. Yes. I, uh, you know, make an offer and try to buy that. And I make offers and um, successful a good bit of time and bit of the time and so you know so I lead a, a active life we spend a lot of time out in the country it's yeah. out in the hellhole swamp area of the um, of the national forest yes we don't hunt we feed everything and if you're kind to your wild neighbors you know they'll respond yeah so we have lots of wild turkeys that come right up in the yard they come right up on the deck <laughs> and lots of ducks it's a cypress swamp behind us we got lots of Wood ducks back there, and lots of deer, um, all the small games, coons and squirrels and everything else, yes. and uh, we really enjoy it. That is good to hear. Well, take me back. I know 
a couple of years ago, your son Thomas Ravenel was in some trouble. Right. How did you deal with that as a father? How, what was your secret to overcoming that, the keep, uh, with basically keeping your composure? Well, you know, he was very successful. He's been very successful. Yeah. And uh, he, did, <clears throat> he did a lot of entertaining, and he uh, was friendly with a, 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 a group of downtown Charleston <clears throat> people his same age, and they would have parties. And uh, what they would do is they would start um, uh, smoking some different things, you know, marijuana and then um, uh, cocaine. And uh, so anyhow, they, um, I, was, I was tipped off to the fact that, that he was doing uh, some drugs at these parties that they were having. He wasn't selling it or anything. They were just using it recreational, which is against the law. So I warned him about it, and uh, he said, Oh, not me, Daddy. I said, All right, if you lie to your daddy, they will catch you. And uh, so then he, he went ahead. He's very successful politically, and because he was elected state treasurer, he made about three or four races, you know, and, and won it primaries in the general election, was serving, and then they, they, uh, they, they charged him. And because uh, he was highly visible, and because um, he was an elected state officer. The, the thing I've always wondered about it is, how about all of these friends, all prominent, a lot of them are prominent Charleston people, you know, they left them alone. Of course, because he was a state treasurer, they, they put, the, put the knife to him, and it was a, a real disappointment to me and our family. And, um, but, uh, you know, he, uh, he violated the law, and, um, uh, he's called down for it, and uh, he admitted he admitted his guilt, and uh, he was sentenced to ten months in prison, federal prison. He served his time. Uh, family members and friends, we'd visit him every weekend. He was down in Georgia, and um, so anyhow, he was. Um, <clears throat> He got a great sense of humor, and of course, in our family, we have a good sense of humor, you know. And uh, he uh, he was cheerful throughout. Made a bunch of friends down there, and he said, "Daddy, I'm locked up down here." He says, "With uh, two thousand other innocent people." <laughs> wow! <laughs> you know how it is. <laughs> you get caught doing something bad, and you get uh, you, 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 you get convicted, and you get in jail. You know, so many people say, "Oh man, I'm not guilty." You know, this and that and the other. So we kind of laughed at that. Locked up with two thousand innocent people. Everybody got their own story. You know, but he never had any story except you know he broke the law, and he's he's uh, he's paying the price, and. Uh, so anyhow, he got out and he was on parole. I forget by exactly how long, a couple of years it seemed to me like. Went right back into business and is doing well. And uh, he uh, always been an outdoorsman and what have you. So he took up polo. Some of his friends played polo, you know, and so he fell in with the the polo playing group. So now he's got some polo horses. He bought one of the old places down on Edisto Island, and he stays down there most of the time. And he's got some polo horses and a barn, and and then he dabbles in business, and uh, he uh, he builds and owns uh, and leases small shopping centers. He's very successful at that. Well, let me tell you. Um, I know you were involved in the rest, the real estate business. How did the bug bite you? How did you get involved with that? Well, I was raised during the Depression. Okay. And uh, I went into the Marine Corps the last year of the war. Yes, sir. So I was in long enough to get enough time under the GI Bill to go to college. 
So I went to the college of Charleston and uh, on the GI Bill. And uh, I doubled up on my subjects because I didn't have enough time in to get, you know, four years. So I did the whole thing in, in less than that. And I graduated there and uh, with, with a BS in, uh, in history and political science, which qualified me to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, let me tell you, you know. I got up and I, I needed a job. Yes, see? yes. So what I did was, the first thing I did, I went to the Navy Yard yeah. and made an application. Yes. And um, <laughs> they said they didn't have any openings. Okay. So I left there and I went to the paper mill. Yes. And I went in there and uh, there behind the counter was a fellow who'd been in the Boy Scouts with me. And, uh, and I said, man, what are, what are you doing here? His name was Edward Mura. And he says, man, I'm the, <coughs> I'm the assistant employment manager. He says, what are you doing here? I said, man, I'm looking for a job. He says, man, you got a job. Wow. <laughs> so he gave me a job. Yeah, it's all about who you know. That's right. Yeah. I just happened to run into right, him. Exactly. It's just luck. You yes, know? absolutely. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Right. And uh, I was making a dollar fifty seven cents an hour. Wow. But of course, that was a lot more money than it is now. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And shoot, a dollar was a dollar. <laughs> right. You could do a long, you could do a lot with a dollar. Yeah. So anyhow, I worked there for uh, almost a year, and I really enjoyed it. Yes. And then a cousin of mine, who was the uh, sales manager of a home improvement business, wow. he came to me and he said, listen, he says, I believe you could, you could really sell home improvements, you know, insulating people's houses for uh, cooling and, and, and heating and uh, Weather stripping and making aluminum awnings and uh, and adding a screen porch and stuff like that. And uh, he says, the pay is on commission. He said, but if you can really get out there and work, he said, you can make a lot more money than you making here at, at, at the mill. Yeah. So I took the job. Okay. And I did did very well. Knocking on doors. Yeah. Man, I tell you. Yeah. I knocked on some doors. <laughs> <laughs> if you knock on a left of them, you know, you'll... Um, you get in. <laughs> you know, they say a blind hog will find an acorn if he roots far enough. That's you right. probably heard that. <laughs> see? So anyhow, I did well there, and uh, then I decided to go into the home improvement business for myself. Sure. So there was a fellow who had been working with me, and... Uh, I don't know if he was still working or whether he had quit or, or what have you. So yeah. I borrowed $300 from my grandmother. Okay. And we started a little home improvement business. Oh. And uh, we'd uh, do weather stripping and uh, home, and, you know, paint your house. That's anything right. to improve your house. Sure. And then we started manufacturing aluminum awnings, which were very popular back then. You don't see any more of them anymore see them anymore, but right. anyhow, that was popular back then. Put on gutters on the house, Yes. new roof. Then I started building houses. I built a couple of houses, built a house and sold it. Did pretty good. Wow. So then I, you know, built another house and sold that. You just kind of got into that, see. So then I was in the JCs over there on St. Andrew's Parish. They call it all West Ashley now, yes. but back then it was St. Andrew's Parish. Okay. And I was in the JCs over there. So I met some guys in the JCs who had graduated as engineers in the, from the Citadel. And they had technical knowledge. Yes. So we, um, they came to work for me and we started doing commercial work. See, I didn't know anything about what the hang we were doing, but, <laughs> but, but they did. Yeah. Because yeah. they had the technical knowledge and I knew how to handle the money, you sure. know. Sure, sure. And um, so anyhow, as a matter of fact, one of the things that we did was the Sham Creek Bridge, you know where that is? Yes. That was a two-lane bridge. Wow. And uh, we got the contract to make it a four-lane bridge. Yeah, yeah. And you see the date on it, I think it's 1958. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we did that. We yeah. did that. And uh, then we did some other bridge work and commercial work and what have you and started doing that. And I, 
because I was raised in St. Andrews and my family's always been farming people. And uh, I always liked the cattle. Yes. And um, so I always had cattle. Yeah. And uh, I bought some property on Johns Island and leased some property west of the Ashley, sure. St. Andrews and what have you. Yeah. Built up a good herd of cows and, and uh, started buying timber land. And, you know, had the ups and downs. Either on, you know, that's the way business is. Yes. Like people ask me, what you do now? I said, well, when I'm not doing anything else. I keep an eye on the stock market. I said, <laughs> yeah. boy, that's a, <laughs> that'll, 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 that'll really, really give you a pain in the, uh, in a <laughs> headache. <laughs> if you're fooling with a few stocks. But anyhow, and so I went through it, and then I got into politics. Yeah. I always liked politics. Well, you know, I was wondering, how did you get involved in politics? Well, let me tell you, when I was at the College of Charleston, there was a fellow there by the name of Jack Leland. Okay. And a lot of people will know him, you know, uh, that uh, he's dead now. But he was from McClellanville. Okay. And he was there. He was a veteran student. And uh, he ran for uh, president of the, uh, of the student body. Yes. So um, he asked me to help him. We didn't even have 400 students at the College of Charleston. Wow. Now they're trying to top it off at 10,000. Right. We didn't even have 400. This is in 1946, uh, 7, and 8, something like that, you know. Wow. And uh, so anyhow, I helped him. And I really liked it. You know, we politic other people and ask people to vote and do this and that and the other. And, and uh, I really liked it because it was politics. Sure. And um, he got beat. He didn't make it. 